get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited to have another Jeremy. Jeremy Smith co-founded Spot Hero with Mark Lawrence and Larry Kiss. Spot Hero is an on-demand app that makes parking easier for the daily driver. In my words, they've disrupted the traditional parking industry, essentially. And he has helped build the company from zero to 73 team members right now. Their app has helped over 2 million cars park. There are over 1,000 parking facilities that have partnered with them. And Spot Hero has raised over $27 million to date and has grown to over 13 cities. Jeremy, thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is an awesome way to usher in the new year. Woohoo! I'm very excited. And Same here. I always like to include a fun fact about yeah. someone. And you have a lot of fun facts from stand-up comedy, audio books, a silent meditation, which maybe we'll talk about what that means. But, yeah. but a fun fact is you've traveled to over 40 countries and you just did um, four months abroad. That's correct. So... What did you learn on your four months abroad? Why did what made you decide to to take that journey, that trip? Yeah, so I actually uh, I I left uh, I left Spot Hero probably about seven eight months back, and the first thing I wanted to do after going through that was you know really just getting some time to to be totally by myself and do some of the things that I love to do. So I decided to take a, a really fun uh, backpacking journey. I had a one way ticket to to Russia, and I a didn't know where ticket. I was. A one a one way ticket to Russia. I'm, I'm I'm guessing that not many people fall into that same <laughs> category as me, but I figured you know let's let's start there and see where things take me. And along the way, I just kept going to a bunch of interesting places, and I kind of just followed what I thought would be what I thought would be a lot of fun. And it was probably one of the greatest experiences of my entire life. So when you did it, you didn't plan any other cities besides going to Russia. Oh, I knew I wanted to make it to Thailand at some point because I right, but you hadn't booked anything. Like things. You just no, booked just, a ticket to Russia. I don't, I don't, I don't like to, I don't like to get things all planned out. I'd love to have the flexibility and there's always a way if you're flexible with your times that you can get, you know, pretty decent, um, right. pretty decent flights, places and, you know, and you'll, you'll, it just all ends up working really well. So yeah, I had no place to stay, one way ticket, no apps downloaded and you just kind of figure out when you go. That's kind of what <laughs> makes it really, that's kind of what makes it fun and exciting. So what did you have in mind when you were going to plan this trip? Or not plan yeah. this trip. What cities did you want to hit? What did you? Is there anything you wanted to get out of? Yeah, get totally. out of it overall. I, I there were actually three. There were actually like three things that I wanted to get done. So yeah. the first, like as I was thinking about my trip in thirds, I wasn't sure how long it was going to be. But the first third was all about just like have fun. Like I didn't want to. I've been working for five years nonstop. I mean, we're talking like you know fourteen, fifteen hour days, yeah. six days a week, and. I really wanted to just go through, have a great time, not think of anything back home and just have be in a totally different culture shock place, which is what Russia was. Then I wanted to go and, you know, just get to enjoy good warm weather and really just like a healthy environment. And that was that was Thailand for me. And then mm-hmm. the other third was let's get a little bit acclimated back to what it would be like in the US and let's uh, you know, let's start thinking about like what might be the you know, the future direction of where you want to go. And for me that was more of like uh that was more of the, this meditation that I did, and then also going to Australia. So, um, those were the three things that I really wanted to achieve in my trip. Uh, but you know, the, the most important thing too is like just be present for the experience. You know, don't always have to think about the future all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. There's definitely something to be said for you know realizing that you're doing something wild and cool that most people don't get to do, and yeah. just go through and appreciate the fact that you're doing it yeah and i want to talk about we'll talk about spot hero and not just yeah. the the good times but i want to talk about the non-stop working you know 20 hour day times to the reality of it but i do want to talk about what you just said is where you want to go what did you learn from the meditation what did you figure out at, at this point um where you want sure. to go yeah so i figured out um in that in that meditation that you know i truly have found something that i love to do entrepreneurship and yeah. build businesses and 
I'd really like to build businesses that can do better for society. So that doesn't necessarily mean create a business that, you know, helps out a charity. But if it's something, you know, like a spot hero that makes people's lives easier, can save them money, that type of, that's something that I really identify with. So I really would love to do, like, I'd say I came out of there and I had just as much of a fire for building businesses as before. Yeah. Uh, You know, but I think I have like more of an understanding of things that actually interest me in the categories. You know, I realized I really do like spending time with people. I'd like to do things in the HR space. I really like services that make people's lives easier. I think that's kind of the future of where things are going. And I think I got a little bit more clarity around that as I was doing um, some time alone. Yeah. And when we talked before we hit record, one of the big things you want, messages you want to talk about just in general about entrepreneurship, what do you think people should, how they should think about entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, I look at entrepreneurship as um, it's not it's not something for everybody, but for some people who believe that they want to be their their own bosses or have a vision of making you know doing something impactful for the world, entrepreneurship's mm-hmm. an incredible tool uh, to go through and do that. Um, it's very you know it's it's uh, it's de- definitely difficult because the script is not necessarily written for what you have to do, but that's right. kind of fun in it. Just like <laughs> like one way ticket to Russia. Right. You just kind of you go yeah. through and you figure it out along the way, and you know that's truly what I really that I really like, and you know we've just seen it, and you know we've seen it in the United States. You know one of the reasons that you know we have all the opportunities that we do are because we are filled with a country of risk takers and yeah. people that have gone and followed their beliefs and you know really tried to change the world, and you know this is one of the best tools to go through and do it. And for the people that have ever thought about it or have have dreams and ambitions, you know all you have to do is you just have to make the commitment and jump. And you'll figure it out along the way. And hey, worst case scenario, you know what? You end up with a few bucks in your bank account. You'll find a way not to go into the negative, and you'll have come out with more skills than you had before. You know, which I believe will serve you better. And no matter no matter what you do. Yeah. And so, on that, you want people to take a risk on themselves and in the business. And um, what if someone's listening to this and they're like on the fence, right? Yeah. I'm curious what you do internally. And think about how you push yourself over to to take that risk. You know, yeah. for you, it's, it's probably easier each time you do it. But for, let's say it's someone for the first time. You were there, right? So yeah. how did you make that leap? How was that? Was that hard for you? Was was it? Yeah, not? it's incredibly hard. I mean, honestly, you you have to use psychology. You almost have to sometimes like just convince yourself that you need to go through and do it. So you know, even at nights now, when there's certain things that I know I want to achieve, you know, I'll I'll pray for them. And if the more the more that I can do that, the more I get that ingrained in my head. And when I start getting an idea and it's something a little bit crazy, I start talking about it with more people and I tell more people I'm going to do it. You know, it's just like this move to San Francisco. It's like I told one person, yeah, I think I'm going to move to San Francisco. And then I told another person, it's like, yeah, I'm almost positive I'm going to move there. (laughs) No, now I'm moving to San Francisco. And if I tell more and more and more people about it, then I know that I've got a whole bunch of weight on it. They hold you accountable. I have to go through and do it. So honestly, like part of this is like (laughs) – I don't really, I just care about the end results, you know, and if the end results are good, it doesn't matter how ridiculous of a path I need to go through and take yeah. it. It'd be great to just say that I can make these internal decisions myself and then just go with it, but I'm not necessarily strong enough. But if I'm not strong enough to do it, well, how can yeah. I get myself there? Yeah. And I use a lot of these other things to, to get me there. So I'll do yeah. that. I, I, I do a lot. Yeah, of, I love hearing this. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I do a lot of reflecting and writing in, uh, in my own journal. And so in those in those journals too, that's time for me to, you know, plant the seeds of things that I want to do. Yeah. And I think that's kind of like beautiful. I mean, it's it's kind of what Napoleon Hill talks about in Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. You just have to have the belief in it. And if you can get yourself to believe it, something can become yeah. possible. Yeah. Great I have that quote on my computer, whatever you can conceive and believe you can achieve. But yeah. Whatever you can conceive and believe you can achieve. And it's so it's so true. You know, I'm not the I'm not the smartest guy. Um, you know, but I can but I can, you know, understand that there are ways that I can help control the way that I think. And, you know, if I can push myself into some of these uncomfortable places and just show up and then go through the motions, it'll get me there. Yeah. What's another uncomfortable thing that you did? Like San Francisco, you know, you, it seems like you, you do that. You put yourself in uncomfortable situations and it builds your tolerance. What else yeah. have you done that you, people would be like, I, that's crazy. Jeremy. Yeah. So anybody who knows me knows I will not shut up. Uh, I'm, Every time I take a test on personalities, I'm probably I'm about 100% extroverted, not even 99%. So 
all of my happiness is derived like being around people mm-hmm. um, and to just like get me to like be quiet for like 10 or 15 minutes is really <laughs> difficult but while I was on my trip yeah. uh, I had a chance to do a silent meditation in Bali so that was 11 days I think it was like it's technically 10 days but it was longer than that of no talking 10 and days of no like, talking no talking sitting in meditation for 11 hours the whole day. 10 days yeah or is it wow yeah, a whole a whole ten days, and then also I think that even harder part was that they they would only feed you twice a day, and it was all these vegetarian meals that were all rice based. And I'm pretty active, and you know probably half of my diet comes from comes from uh, fats and proteins. But um, you know it was very, it was a big shock to my system. Yeah, but it was a really fantastic experience because I got to experience what. With the complete opposite person of me would like to do in their free time, you know, a completely introverted person. This would be the type of thing that they would do for their, um, for their release. And it was just a great way for me to mm-hmm. become more comfortable being alone by myself. And it's a tough under- one. Yeah. Yeah. But like getting a chance to disconnect and just like when you're in those situations where you don't have things competing for your attention, you just start realizing how much easier it is to like to make decisions and you know, that you, you were put in a situation where you have to face certain um, insecurities that you have. Hmm. And I think those type of moments are very important in your development because a lot of times people spend time running from things that they're insecure about. Yeah. Yeah. And it's v- masked in a lot of things. It's masked in, um, in their work ethics. Some people will just go to work all day long instead of facing, you know, internal problems at home. They'll get into drugs, alcohol. They'll, they'll work out a ton and when you're forced to just sit down and address it, like you have, you have nowhere else to run, hide, blame. It's you and your thoughts and your mind, yeah. and you really just have to become at ease with the person you are. And I think that's truly awesome. Like that is, you know, that is. There's really something to be said for you know, like it's possible to live a very fulfilled, happy life just sitting there alone in your thoughts by yourself, content with the person you are. And you know, I think in a world where we value so much of just possessions, accomplishments, you know, we lose sight of, uh, of other ways of achieving happiness and it's all tied towards something more and something more and some people never even get there even though they have all the things that everybody else says make them successful and happy. Right. So what made you decide to do that in the first place? I mean, you could have gone to Bali and like sat on the beach, you, yeah. know, you, know, you know, worked out, you know, drink coconut juice. What made you decide to even do this meditation? Yeah, I mean, the seed had been planted in my head a lot earlier. Um, I remember one of my one of my really close friends. He's a very very well known poker player, but he um, he had gone through one of these experiences and told me all the good things about it. And I remember mm. hearing about it and getting so uncomfortable and nervous. <laughs> what did he I say get, was good about it? What did I he mean, tell you? He, he said like he just was able to identify more when his mind was wandering. He was able to identify like when he started feeling um, certain. Uh, certain like emotions inside Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he kind of understood more of the root cause of what was leading him to feel that way and realized maybe it's his mind playing playing tricks on itself and your mind does play tricks on your itself more than you could ever imagine but he planted the seed i remember getting really nervous and like i said when i get really nervous usually i end up doing it it might not happen right away but i know i'm just like shit i need to do it because i believe in pushing a comfort zone and the more and more you can push it now it's like there's there's really only a few things that that would probably get me really really scared. Heights is still one of them. Despite um, bungee jumping and skydiving, I can't even like stand off of like a ten story building. I just like still get. So anybody who thinks that that's going to solve your problems, like no, it's it's not. If you're afraid of heights, you're just afraid of heights. <laughs> um, so he he placed it in my head, and I remember being in a I was in a I was in an all Russian club in Thailand, and I was just having this heart to heart conversation about this girl who works at a at a at a at a, a fashion studio or like some type of like beauty salon and she's just telling me how she's done this twice now and it's changed her life really yeah we were just having a heart to heart conversation over the the loud music and i'm like you know what i need to go home so i i just like left everybody there got on my motorbike drove home 20 minutes and signed up online for the first thing that i could find and you wow. know i had heard that bali was a lot like thailand so i figured why not let's, let's just do it that's awesome so how do you bring that now? Now that you're you're in Chicago, you're moving to San Francisco, you're going to be in like Silicon Valley area, part of technology. How do you bring that meditation now daily to yourself? 
I mean, I think part of it is just showing up and doing it. Uh, I haven't been as good about con- like about staying with it. Do they tell but, you when you leave you should do 30 minutes? I mean, what do they tell you to do when you leave? Because obviously think, you can't I, just be in silence the whole day. Yeah, I think ideally <laughs> what they think is that you should be spending uh, – you should have like two hours a day of practice, like an mm. hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon. Yeah, That's just like not possible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think in an ideal world it would be great to get a good like 15 to 20 minutes in like every so often. Mm-hmm. One of the problems is like what I what I really did realize like doing this is – just like you do anything in life, when you really want to experience the most out of it, you almost have to become like really, really into it. And to me, I think I'd probably extract more value by going through one really long, longer, like one long session. Yeah. Getting a chance to really like let, you know, just remove all thoughts possible. But yeah. I don't know. We'll see. I, I, I have done an okay job of sticking with it, but I'd like to do better. Yeah. And, you know, that's just one of the trade offs and decisions yeah. I'm going to have to make when yeah. I get out. So, Jeremy, when you were young, what did you want to do when you grew up? It's crazy. I always wanted to be a business owner. You did? I, oh, yeah, I always knew I wanted. I had no idea. Why I, is that? Your family or what? No, I don't come from an entrepreneurial family. My mom has worked in the same job for 37 years. Um, she's a CTMRI technician at a, at a hospital in Skokie, and my dad is a lawyer. But I don't know. There's something – I always liked money a lot, which is funny. Like I st- So I still like money, but I, I – actually avidly try not to spend if at all possible um mm. i just like i think that there's more a lot more to money and that's just kind of like more of like a buy i think maybe a byproduct of how successful you were at your endeavor um but i knew i wanted to be a business owner um I, what did you do what were some of your early entrepreneurial efforts yeah i mean i just remember uh, being pretty good on the sales side like we had a uh, we probably had a fundraiser for local something and I forget what it was but they had us going through the, the neighborhood selling flowers and I probably sold like 15 to 20 times the amount really? of the second person I went door to door I I was selling hundreds of dollars of of hosta plants and you name it so what were your tactics back then how old were you uh I was young I mean I was probably in like early teens okay. maybe younger than that what were your so tactics to sell I would just show- at the door and then tell people what I was doing and like just be very pushy. I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I wish I could say I had a more tactical approach, but I'm more of a, you know, just like show, like show it up there. Like you got to just go through it and you then just, just pound the pavement. Consistent. Yeah. So I did that and had a, a lot of success and I, whenever I also needed cash, I would, I would go through and just shovel people's driveways. So I just show up at the door, like ready to go and just allow people to pay me whatever they thought was, was right. Oh, really? Yeah. So the, you yeah. said just pay me whatever you think is fair. It is fair. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, if somebody if somebody wanted some guidance, I probably gave them some ideas. But that's interesting. Okay. So yeah, how, like people for, the, people for the most part, they're not going to screw over like a like a young kid, you know? Right. So how do you use those tactics and um, sales? Because you had to go park, you know, pound, pound the pavement for parking garages. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, like so. As an entrepreneur, you're always selling. And one of the things I've really realized is like, I just love people. And by spending a lot of time with people, I've found that I can just I'm, – I am I'm good at getting I, – I, I feel like around people, I feel very comfortable um, asking tough questions, pushing the buttons. I've always got used to pushing people and seeing where I can go. And I feel like I've been able to develop – I can develop rapports with people fa- fairly quickly. And mm-hmm. You know, sales is a lot, it's a lot just like that. For me, it's not necessarily, I'm not just trying to get somebody to say yes to me because, but I, part of it is like getting to learn about them along the way and it's cool and I like taking detours all over the place just to learn more about them. It's just fun. I think that's kind right. of what makes it like cool. And then when it, then when you develop that relationship, if it's something that's like, I think anybody who's good in sales, like it has to be value add on both sides. Like, you know, it can't just be one per like one person's really getting screwed in a transaction. Like you have to deliver value. If you have to deliver value and you've got a good person, like that that type of sale should go through every single time. Yeah. So I think for me it was never a problem. Like I liked getting on the grounds. I grew up in Skokie, so it was very multicultural when I would show up in the parking garages and we had a lot of different minority groups. Like it felt like home for me. Like I just got I feel like I can relate to a lot of different people, which is really cool. Yeah. And so um, you know, you got to run the gambit of a lot of different, a lot of different nationalities, cultures, which I was used to, and then also, 
you know, you get to the parking people who are a lot blue collared. And I, th I think of myself mm. as, you know, very blue collared as well. It's like, you got to show up there, got to, you know, roll up your sleeves, not afraid to get dirty, have, have a little bit of fun with it. And I think all of those things really helped when you're trying to get, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of blue collared people together to come on to a platform and say, let's try selling parking online. Yeah. Yeah. No, so you always wanted to be a business owner. You went to U of I, then you were for Motorola. <laughs> yep. What did that leap look like? What did the early version, first version of Spot Hero look like? Are you still yeah. working at Motorola at the time? or are you? No, no, no. I had left Motorola. I was working in corporate finance, and it was just uh, – it really wasn't the right fit because it was more of like an introverted type of role, and I'm, I needed to be in something more extroverted. Uh, and I took probably about like six months off. In, a, in the same type of place of what I'm doing now, and I actually started, I was working at a pizza shop at the time. Uh, it was really cool. I liked this pizza shop and wanted to take it across country because uh, I thought they had a really cool business model. And I just kept getting a whole bunch of parking tickets along the way. And so <laughs> point, at that point. I think I watched somewhere you had like up to $5,000 of parking tickets or something. I Yeah, I've, yeah. I've done myself a, a number on that. But I got myself a bunch of parking tickets and I'm like, all right, it's time to go through and do something about this. And so the first version of Spot Hero was like, it was just an idea. I mean, we were selling our first spots on Craigslist. It was just putting up a post and allowing somebody who saw a spot available as just a test. Would they be willing to like, to just see a spot, pay for it, and people would show up in my house yeah. giving cash, like on game days, saying, all right, I just want the spot. It's like, great. Um, that was the first idea. Like, you went from, I have all these parking tickets, how do I solve this? What were some of the the ways you thought you could solve it? Yeah, I mean, so we, we got started at first with just doing people's driveways. So the, the whole idea behind Spot here in the early days was, my neighbor has a driveway spot that sits unused while they're at work, and the Cubs play a lot of home games, so they should be willing to rent out their spot, make money, because they're not even going to be home anyways. Right. Okay. Um, so we started with that approach at first, and it was it was okay. I mean, we like it took us it took us a while to get our first version of a website up, which is its own other like you know like challenge challenge in yeah. itself. But we um, we started selling just a few spots a game. I mean, I remember like. It, when I say a few, it's like one to two spots a game. Then it became a little bit more and a little bit more, and then we got to the point where it's like the end of the season where I was like, crap, well, what are we going to do? Because once the Cubs leave, you can't really sell all this excess parking because there's plenty available during the day. Right. Then that's kind of where we pivoted and found a better, you know, a better fit. But, you know, the first version was people's driveway spots through a really janky website, and it was just to basically see would people even be willing to pay for this. Yeah. So I think I listened somewhere you'd actually drive people to the game or something. They'd park in the spot. How, how would that work? Yeah, that happened a little bit later. Oh, okay. Uh, I think that happened around Soldier Field. Okay. So we had like a few people that were parking, I think, underneath the the L train tracks okay. out there. And, you know, you had a, a number of these people. It's a, it's a long walk for them to get to the stadium mm -hmm. because Soldier Field doesn't really have the most well-set-up parking situation. I mean, there's some people that have – uh, parking permits that allow them to park right near the stadium. If not, you have to be on the other side of Lakeshore Drive. Right. Uh, so I think we sh we shuttled them out there, which was kind of cool. And I mean, that's just the stuff that we did in the early days. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it, you you can't be afraid to roll up your sleeves. It's like go deliver the best freaking experience to somebody that you can, and just be grateful that they're your customers. Yeah. So you went from the um cubs games what was the next i guess the next stage for spot hero yeah the next stage well mark had been doing a really good job of like getting us integrated in social media and he was having a back and forth twitter conversation with one of the big parking garage operators central parking and along the way um with central parking they just got to the point where they're like well why don't you just come in and let's talk about how we could work together so that was just like he did an amazing job on that. And then we sat down and had a conversation with them. And I remember yeah. sitting at their big table. Yeah. We'd never, I'd never really been in a sales setting like that before. But you've been just, in a harder sales setting. You're going door to door selling flowers. That's that. That's <laughs> I mean, but that was just like bullying people because I was a cute kid. <laughs> this is a little bit different. I, I wasn't going to be able to pull this cutesy stuff with a bunch of parking people. Right. So. Yeah, we just sat along the table with them, and they're like, "Well, what are you trying to do?" And they told us they had 
these parking garages they need to sell spots on, so they wanted to give it a try. And by the end of that meeting, I think we had a we had our first location. They were going to give us a bunch of spots, and it was in the downtown. And so we were just ecstatic that they were willing to work with us. Yeah. So they they posted it. You know, we didn't get any special discounts. It was a very rough system of figuring it out, but we worked with whatever we got and, you know, just went from there. Yeah. How do you, at that point, I mean, I've used your your service many times before. It's very seamless with the app and the check-in. I'm at that, that point, I'm assuming you don't have any of that. How did you, one, get people to that, the, the spot, and what, did, like, the technology component, what did that look like at the time? Yeah, so, get, so getting people to the spot. Um, the first part was we just needed people to buy the spots. So we worked at a co-working facility. Uh, we worked at the Tech Nexus, which is right at 200 South Wacker, mm-hmm. which is fairly close to 500 West Monroe, mm-hmm. where we had this parking garage. And we okay. strategically wanted this one because we knew we might be able to get some people there. Yeah. So we begged all of them to send people there. Um, we paid for a bunch of the spots ourselves. So we would go through and park there. Um, a lot of the events, a lot of the uh, parking that they gave mm-hmm. us at first was at night. So we partnered up with all the people who would throw events at the place and we'd give a link out for parking where they could go through and um, they could share it with their audience of people. Yeah. So we tried a bunch of different ways of funneling in traffic yeah. to that one parking location. And I mean, like at first it was, we were talking about a handful of spots being sold, but, it, but part of it was like, I don't even think they believed that it could work. The fact that they saw some level of traction was enough to say, all right, this is worth a test. Let's try to go through and do more of it. Yeah, yeah. And so how do you decide how to charge them or the you know, the, the business deal? Yeah, for them? we just looked at what Amazon was charging in their marketplace of, uh, for, for, uh, for parking. And you know, that's just one of the things that we thought that, that was really fair uh, to give through with the parking garages. And we kind of kind of rolled with something similar to that and you know I think that that kind of falls in line with what a lot of other marketplaces you know are doing across across the country you know we really try to do something that's fair for the people on the platform and I think that's one of the reasons why we've been a successful company yeah and so you so, so from the beginning it stayed the same the business model it's like a percentage of whatever people yeah, pay that's correct it's yeah. just been a little bit of a different focus of what type of spot and what type of customer we've been going after and they didn't Jeremy they didn't even give you a discount on the spots at the beginning, no. No, they just gave us access to the same drive-up rate. It was interesting, though. I mean, it was a $6 spot starting at night times in a loop, which is fantastic and cheaper than the street. The problem is they couldn't advertise that to the outside because it was a really nice professional building. They didn't want to like make the cheapen the brand of the building by yeah. showing parking rates on the outside. So ongoing people wouldn't even know that that existed. So, yeah. I think for us, you know, people people were probably willing to pay for it because either they liked us as people, or two, they saw the price and they're like, "This is good enough." And then when they realized that, like, we try to do some other things to make it better for them. We had customer support there. We were really helpful. We gave them good pictures of what to look out for. Um, we were really responsive, and that made a big difference. Yeah. So first of all, how did you even meet uh, your co-founders? Yeah. So Mark was actually uh, a roommate of mine. Uh, okay. So we had a mutual friend named Brandon. Uh, after college, Mark was living with Brandon, and I had studied abroad with, with Brandon in Manchester in the United Kingdom. And so Brandon introduced the two of us, and he's like, look, guys, I'm moving out, but Jeremy should move in. And he basically put us together for a night and is like, I want you guys to move in. And we hit it off really well, and you know, I ended up moving in with him. We lived together for about like six months and had a great time. And it was actually until maybe like five, and then I moved to a different part of the city where I wanted to be. And you know, it wasn't until maybe about five months after we were living together that that me and Mark got together on this project. But um, so that was happening, and then I'm trying to think. And then Larry, so we spent the first year of Spot Hero just doing a lot of networking. So we were always out in the tech scene yeah. every single day. Were you and doing this full time at the time? Or yeah, we yeah we full-time. made the decision when we got into it. We're just it's like a tough Let's decision full time. Yeah, that was a really. Mark is really, really intelligent when it comes to just under, just has a very good like sense of what is needed to be successful. Yeah. And he really hit it on the head at first, which was, you know, like he basically said, you know, we're going to need to make this our full time thing if we want to be successful. Yeah. And I didn't quite understand the nature of, you know, how important that 
that really was at the time, but he was he was spot on. Like this is this was more than a full time job, even though we didn't necessarily have anything to really show for it. Yeah. And so we went into it full time, and that meant we were out networking, meeting tons of people. And over the course of networking, that that was one of the areas where I was really add, able to add a lot of value yeah. to the organization. Um, I just met a whole. I met tons of different developers. We would test them out. It wouldn't work out. And I remember just getting a message one day from this guy named Kevin, who are not who I'm now definitely tight with. And I didn't even remember meeting Kevin, but he's like, hey, it was great talking to you yesterday, whatever. It's like, I've got a friend of mine named Larry's. So you should totally meet him. I'm like, he's like, he's a good developer and he might be interested in this. I'm like, sure, why not? Okay. So I get, I remember having Larry come to my apartment. Uh, I had this like cool little balcony and he came in there and I'm like, hey, you want something to drink? He's like, yeah, what do you got? I'm like, I have one beer left if you want it. So I offered him a beer. He drank it as I sat sitting around drinking water and we just hung out on my porch and you know, we just had a really good conversation. We didn't talk anything about developing or programming. It was just like very happened all very naturally. Mm-hmm. And he got started and just started working in on the business and put in a put in his time. Like he kind of came in as like, I just want to get my hands dirty. He got his hands dirty and then yeah. he was um what did he do? Now at this point, do you is it on a handshake at this point? It was like, on a hand yeah, it was on a handshake. On a handshake. Yeah. He worked with us on a handshake for six months. We'd been doing it for about a year, and as a result, Larry's gotten a very good chunk of equity in the company, and he deserves every single bit of it because, you know, he took a chance on us, and yeah. you know, he just started working on it, and he trusted in us, and we tried to do right by him as well. And so, you know, very thankful, you know, I'm very thankful for that, and he's been a great leader and a great partner uh, to work with as well. And so, um, I don't know. How do you, you know, support just, yourself at the time? Because it is a big leap, and no and you can't, I, you know. I was, I slept on a couch for two and a half years. Yeah. So I would, I Airbnb'd my apartment, mm. and that helped me cover all of my expenses. Wow. So I, you know, I'd have like one, two people at a time yeah. in a room. So we imagine a small, cramped apartment where you had my room that had two people in it. Then my your room roommate, had two people in it. My just my room alone. Wow. It's a two bedroom place. So I was already splitting the rent with somebody else. He'd have his girlfriend over, and I'd be on the couch. So we'd have five people in like <laughs> a 500, 600 square foot like area, and that's just like what I had to do. You yeah. know, yeah. You're like I wasn't about to ask anybody else for help. Um, I really wanted to get this. I would go up to networking events just to show up and eat the food that was there. Mm. Um, I would bike a lot of different places. I wasn't really driving. Uh, mm. I was always trying to like find and do the free stuff whenever possible, and yeah. it was crazy. Like I just kind of I got a job. I was working a part time job scrappy. where I eat the food there. Yeah, yeah. You just had to be as scrappy as possible, and you know I actually kind of miss those days. It's, I'm starting now to get back into it, but I miss like that to me is like true is true life. That's that's real living. Like not everybody's sitting in a plush house with no debt. And everything's all hunky dory, and they can right. go buy Whole Foods every single day. Yeah. It's just not how the world works. Like, right. there's something fun about living on the edge. There's something about like, a, like from a survival perspective, am I going to make it? And yeah. can I do it? And you have more fun. You appreciate so much more yeah. in those situations. Like, we're such a materialistic society, and yeah. you know, I think we sometimes forget just the essence of life is just enjoying the ride along the way. And focusing on things now, what were you thinking along the way at that point? Were you enjoying it? What, what was your thought process? You're sleeping on the couch. You have to go to these places for for food. You're you're just trying to survive so your company can survive. Yeah, oh, it was tough. I mean, I loved it. To me, it was cool. Like I was living yeah. in the city. Um, I was meeting new people. I uh, and you guys at this point completely bootstrapped. Yeah, right? yeah, we were bootstrapped. Yeah, yeah totally. I, I mean, I didn't really think anything of it but i'm just like yeah we're working on something that's cool it's different um i was taking a shot at like being an entrepreneur but like when i would say before like it was like as mainstream as it is now because like it, it nowadays it is like everybody is an entrepreneur uh but you know we were still i think at a little bit of an earlier stage than than probably most but to me it was just like fun i was actually like for me this was more of like a could i write my own future right. because the future beforehand for like a college grad is like i mean if you're a college grad, you've got to step up probably on most of the people just because you can open up more doors, but it's very much, well, now you have the right to work in a corporation. Now you have the right to spend the next 30 to 40 years of your life trying to climb yeah. this ladder if you choose to go down this road. Yeah. To me, that was just horrifying. Like I had had the experience of working in big corporate and I, like I imagine just swallowing 
tranquilizers and painkillers be substantially more fun <laughs> than having to go through that 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 thirty year rise to the top. And so for me, this was like cool because it was I was just getting to write my own future. And now because things have worked out well, like I feel a lot more empowered and confident in my abilities. And you know, even if it takes time to get there, I know that uh, it's worked out before. Yeah. I'm more skilled than before. Uh, and I should be able to to do something like this for the rest of my life, and that's really where I want to be. Yeah. You know, like you you get these like hunches, like you know, part of it's like you have to like in a way follow your gut. Like your gut, you just inherently know certain things are the right things for you. And you know, I, I've seen enough over the course of the past five years to know that there's a great thrill and a lot of skills learned and a lot of amazing people met where it's the ultimate place for me to be. Yeah, yeah, and Jeremy, you know, I love that you talk about that because, you know, people could see you on ABC News, Diane Sawyer, they see Spot Hero, all the stats, and they don't think about you sleeping on a couch with five, six people in your, you know, in your apartment. I threw my whole life savings in this. I had, I had nothing. Like, I mean, I really care about being healthy and eating healthy and living healthy. I was just like, I was just like trying to scrap together bread from wherever I could. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But those were the coolest. It, those are the best times. It's not for it's not for everybody. Like for me, I just don't like. I like that griminess. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that's to me, that's the best place to be. So you pivoted to the major garages. When did you hire your first employee? When did you have? So there's three of you, right? So when was the next hire? The first, the first employee was two, like a week before we started our TechStars program in like mm. in the summer of 2012. Yeah. I was taking 30 40 percent of my time was spent on customer service, doing calls with people, and I remember sitting in Troy Hennikoff, who's the managing director of TechStars, which yeah. is a startup incubator in Chicago. Yeah, just looked at me. He's like, well, "What are you going to do during during Mentor Month?" It was just a series of like meetings that they set up for you to get connected to people in the tech startup community. Like, what do you mean? He's like, "Well, all these customers are going to call, and you have to do mentor mo- meetings. What are you going to do?" I'm like, "I don't know. What am I going to do?" And he's like, you might want to hire somebody. And I just remember looking at him like, what do you mean, hire somebody? He's like, yeah, you know, you like spend money and you hire somebody. <laughs> You're like, I don't and have like, money to the, hire someone. The, the thought, like, it hadn't even like crossed, it hadn't even like crossed my mind at that point. Yeah. I mean, it had crossed my mind, but it's something we really like take an action on at the point, which was like, yeah, now you have like capital and your business is working and you need to start specializing. It's like at a point where the business starts changing, you can't be the jack of all trades. You need to find people who love it, who love certain aspects more than you and are mm-hmm. going to be better at it and get them in the door. So we hustled our way through and got somebody to go through and do it like right in the nick of time. And then it was train them up really quick and free myself up so that I could actually participate in some, I think, higher value add, uh, or well, not necessarily higher value add, but just so I could help the business with a skill set that only I could yeah. do for the business at the time. Right. So, you know, with that, with the business, um, you know, you talk to him. What point do you decide to take outside money? Because tech stars, they take a percentage, right? And they, they invest some money or how does that work usually? Yeah. Um, so they take a small equity position in your company in exchange for um, cash, but more importantly, the, the connections. I mean, the connections were amazing. Yeah. We had made a decision that we wanted to seek funding uh, before going through the program. Yeah. And At what point? That, in the business, like how far along you're like, yeah, we should get funding for this. I mean, we were probably, I mean, we were probably doing like 20, 30 grand a month and like it was barely enough to like, like we were probably paying ourselves a salary of like maybe like a few hundred bucks a month. But it's like, that was like, that's tough. Like when you've been doing it for two and a half years, it's like shit. Like you just like, you need to be able to, you want to accelerate, just cover, yeah. just to cover your basic living expenses, but also we saw market opportunity and it made sense really to like step on the gas a little bit because we had something that was working. So we went through Techstars and we're like, look, if we're going to do this pro- this program, the number one reason why we're going to do it is because we think it's going to accelerate the capital raising process. Yeah. And we thought that that was worth the 6% trade off yeah. made. And like we were so on the money. I mean, we're talking, went through Techstars, all of our metrics were up and to the right. And we went on a road show all throughout uh, Sand Hill Road and in a, like a month after, less than a month after the conclusion of Techstars, we had two term sheets on the table for two and a half million dollars from um, from two of the most well-known. Yeah. I think firms. I was reading like, was Lightbank or was Lightbank later on? 
Yeah, I mean, they, they, they ultimately became investors in the company. Okay. I mean, I can't, just out of uh, respect for everybody involved in the process, I can't necessarily say who were the people that... I'm just saying, it's, I, I'm, I'm not, I'll, I could say, you don't have to confirm or deny, but if you go on Wikipedia, they, they actually do list the investors on Wikipedia. Oh, yeah, it, okay. it's public information about okay. who the investors are, and I've had a great experience working with them and happy to talk about the people that, yeah. that have been investors in the business. So Techstars, tell me about yeah. some of the key mentors and advice they gave you, because you said it was unbelievable. Yeah, it's great. Um, I'd say the big, so I, it could be that my memory is shot. I don't remember one specific piece of advice that's yeah. really stuck out. You know, like you're trying to survive. There is, one, there is one thing I will. I have I have a girlfriend from college who just gave me like one piece of advice that always has stuck with me, and it was just like Jeremy, just be a just you're a good person, just be a good person. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's always like really stuck with me. There's just something about the way she said it, and it was just like her genuine like care and like love for me as a person. And what that, was the context? Why was she saying that? I think it was. I think it's because I was a young. I was a young college student, and yeah. you know, sometimes when you're a young college student, you try to be a little more alpha in certain situations than you probably are, especially if, <laughs> if women are involved. And she was very kind and understanding, and you know, basically told me like, Jeremy, you're at heart a really good guy, so just be true to that. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that, like, you know, what she was just really spot on about. Um, you know, I. I, I don't. I think for anybody, you can't really pretend to be somebody you're not, and it really just comes off as disingenuous when that's the case. So I've really tried staying true to being a good person, and I've really tried surrounding myself with great people. And you know, I can always think back to that quote, which I think was just awesome. But getting yeah. back to the stars, yeah. I wouldn't say there's one piece of advice. Um, we met with a lot of other entrepreneurs who had built companies that sold for hundreds of millions of dollars of yeah. IPO. And, I think the biggest takeaway that I got was really learn to think a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these people, they dream uh, in a much yeah. larger scale than the rest of us. And that was probably one of the hardest things to overcome is we started this business. It was that the, the scale of what our world was, was just, um, it was, oh, we're going to get, we're going to sell Wrigleyville parking. And it wasn't, we're just going to sell Wrigleyville parking. Well, maybe we'll get all the parking in Wrigley Field. Then it was, okay, now we're going to do some downtown parking. Yeah, we're going to get the people, all the people are parking in Chicago. And then it's like, well, why not screw just Chicago? We could do the rest of the United States. And what about the people in the neighborhoods who aren't in the downtown? And what about the rest of the world? And these guys can make the jump from zero to the world like that because they've done it before. Yeah. But when you're a first-time entrepreneur, it's hard for you to dream and believe that big. Yeah. You know, you're almost handicapped by your own thoughts. and. Yeah. They really opened up the door because I could when when I'm sitting across the table from somebody, and I can see that they're a human being like me. Like they're going to the bathroom like me. They're gonna <laughs> sleep like me. They are flawed in the same in their yeah. own ways and flawed just like I'm flawed. That really humanizes it and makes it to the point where you're like, you know what? These people, there's nothing fundamentally different. They're not an alien people. leaking green blood or something. They're like that. They're not alien yeah. leaking the green blood yet, but. If they can do it, why can't I do it? Yeah. And that's you know been a really good yeah. thing to see. You when you're around all these great people, it's like there's nothing different. Yeah. Like I could I can compete with all of them. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't any one piece of advice. It was just being around those people who've done it and realize they're no different from me, and that made you think just as big and totally. it allowed you to make that leap. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So the other cities. What are the, some of the challenges? What was the next city after Chicago? Yeah, uh, the next city where we first tested was Milwaukee because it was really close. There's just things that you just didn't expect that needed to be done. I mean, we had to set, we had to like redo our whole like, I mean, we had to like change up our database to be able to say, okay, well, instead of just selling parking, now each parking spot had to be associated with a city, and that had to be mm. associated with a different manager. Right, right. Different tax implications of going there. You're like Larry, you're gonna have to do more work this month. <laughs> yeah, it was like Larry, you got to do a whole bunch more. Um, and so those were like, those are things that we didn't think about. Um, it wasn't that hard in Milwaukee because a lot of them are surface lots and we could just say, Hey, post the picture. But it became a lot harder once we got to, um, Washington DC because operationally things were just very difficult, different there. So yeah. in DC, what happens is parking garages shut down at nights entirely for, for security purposes. Because a lot of the parking garages are affiliated with government centers, right. they don't want um, they don't want people someone leaving like a car bomb or something crazy. Exactly coming in at night, so they're just like, no, we'll shut the, the garage. And we're used to garages that are twenty four seven. 
Um, a lot of ours were automated as well, so we could direct people to go to a park, uh, exit a parking facility where they would go to the garage, escape, they would hit a call button, and that would route them to somebody. But now they started mm-hmm. to interact with a person that was working there. So you have to work through all those different kinks. Um, there's different expectations of different garages there. They, no one's heard of you before. We actually even had a competitor in there as well. We didn't know the market as well. So you know, it wasn't as clear to us where we needed to be. Um, from an operations perspective, too, uh, we had to figure out, like, if we ultimately figured out that we need to, um, we need to have somebody park first in the garage. In like, we had to have our own person park there because something was inevitably going to get screwed up. Mm. We'd have to you get have that like, your own like personal attendant or something. Yeah, ex- exactly. So we would we have like a whole series of people that will you know have to do that type of stuff to help us make sure that we can get the parking experience right. So there's just a lot of things. Then also different phone numbers. I mean, at what point you did know, you just want to shoot yourself? Like this sounds like such like a logistical nightmare. Yeah, these are hard, and I'm not the, I'm not a logistics guy the same yeah. way. Uh, I was really lucky that that was more of Mark's uh, okay. as Mark's thing. Mark was really involved on the parking garage operator side, the expansion, the strategic direction of the company. I was okay. doing a lot more on the recruiting, uh, capital raising part of the business, uh, helping out on some of the sales and relationships as well, customer support. Um, yeah. But he had to deal with that a lot more, and you know, he's he's definitely I, he's. He's really just great at getting that type of shit done. And, you know, it was really, I mean, I definitely got to experience a little bit of it, but um, I'm glad that he spent more time on that than yeah. me. I mean, it sounds like in the beginning, Jeremy, like everyone, you just do whatever it takes. And then things start to siphon off to your natural ability. And then, so you totally. went more towards like the, the kind of operations, human side of things. And he went more towards like the like CEO role. Or did you actually sit down and have a conversation, or was it just a natural progression? It was it was more of a natural progression, but yeah. I mean, I honestly think I think we did ourselves a disservice doing that. I think we should have had a very clear conversation very early on. Yeah, about what would you have done? Yeah, I would have had a, a much stronger uh, differentiation between who does what. Um, so I would have sat down and been like, "All right, cool. What are your strengths? What are my strengths? What are the things that you want to do? What do I want to do?" And like, let's literally figure out. What are the areas that each of us has to be responsible for? Because if it's not totally set in stone, which one, who does what, ball gets dropped, okay? Yeah, yeah. When there's very clear responsibility as to who does what, it's like that, that whole thing when you have like, when somebody like, when something bad happens in front of like a big crowd, it's almost more dangerous, it's more dangerous than when one individual person sees it because everybody else assumes that the other person's going to do something about it. So that person, like, it's right. It's bad. like the crowd. They're yeah. in a bad place. Yeah. What, you're, what you're supposed to do in those situations is you single out one person, you point at them, and you tell them, I need you to do this. And then right. once they say yes, well, then you've gotten that commitment because yeah. once they com- like once the responsibility is there, they get it done. So, you know, I think we, I would have definitely done that earlier. Yeah. Uh, we eventually kind of had that conversation. But I think by that point, like, we could have probably produced a whole lot more and moved a lot faster. And, been a lot more helpful to each other by doing that. Yeah. So what else are you going to do differently in the next company? Yeah. I'm gonna so do that's a lot. one. I'm going to yeah. do a lot of things differently. I'm going to have a very strong mission and vision from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Like I want, I want it to be very ingrained into people why we do what we do. Okay. Um, and you know, Spot Heroes, you know, like they, they've done a really good job since I've left of like instilling in those mission and vision. You know, but like you fundamentally at the end of the day, it's like the company makes people's lives easier. And like when you have like that type of like understanding, or like that's something that we do, you can always go back to that. Yeah. You know, you can always go like you know like like micro or Apple builds you know like technologies that change the world. They're not just a computer company. Right. They're not just a cell phone company. They build technologies that change the way the world interacts. Yeah. And I think those type of like guiding principles can really help an organization say should we do something or should we not. So to have that a lot more built in um, from a managerial perspective. I think I was I was a really young guy when I did this, so I was 23 and did it till I was 29. And I think at first I wanted to be way too liked by everybody, so I tried to be everybody's buddy instead of like their their coworker. It's quite your natural and, personality in a way too, though. Right? It, it well it, it is, but that 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 was a disservice because there were times where I needed to be a stronger manager and mm. needed certain people to to like to put aside our relationship and say and say we need to get shit done. Pardon my French. Yeah. Right there. Um, but, and I think that that was my ability to do that was undermined because 
I had developed too close a relationship in that yeah. type of view. And it's also an unfair place to put the employees. It's an unfair place because like they're showing up to do something professionally. They have a life outside of it. Um, but at the end of the day, like what should happen in a company is you should, you should definitely like everybody you're there with. And if you become friendly, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But there should be guidelines. There should be lines right. of which you respect for your own good and also for the other good person's yeah. good. In the end of the day, you've really got to be focused on doing things so it's right for the other person. Yeah. You've really got to help them grow and become better and really wish great things for them. Yeah. And I think for me, um, I always wanted good things for people, but a lot of it, I was just like, a lot of things were happening so fast sometimes that I felt like, you know, I was trying to just figure out where I was going. Right. And then also being responsible for yeah. other people was difficult. But now, at least I know enough of what's happening where I can... I can do both at the same time, so I would definitely do that. Um, I would, I would get more people that are. I would get more people in the organization who have done it before. Um, I think we had a tendency to hire people that were a little more junior. And you have to like train we like, them. We like the energy. We had to train, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But you got to have a diversity of skill sets. Like yeah. you got to you got to have people like in there who have done it before because then they can take some of the thinking off of your plate. You know, yeah. it's like, here's how you do X, Y, and Z. Great. Okay, awesome. Let's go through and do that. Um, and young people are amazing. They can grow. And we've se I've seen so many business leaders in our organization start from very junior roles and just grow to like incredible places really quick. Yeah. Uh, but I think I would have, I'd be more looking for people that are even better than me. We, I thought we up-leveled in our organization, got some really great people in, but I'd really try to push that ball more. Um, I would spend more time trying to empower other people and not necessarily try to do the thinking for them because my thinking is flawed and I think a lot of people are smart enough and close enough to the problems where they just need the support to go forward and say, look, whatever you choose to do, go for it. I'm going to hold you accountable to it. If we're not getting where we need to, let's switch it up. But like you're the person and champion this and own it. Because hmm. at the end of the day, you just can't grow a company if you're trying to do – like if, if, you're, if, if you're trying to, you know, like – get in and, and spend more time, I would say, micromanaging versus l empowering the people in the organization. Yeah. So I do a lot of those things differently. I would change the way that I'd, that I'd interact with my board of directors. I felt like I was, uh, in a way, somewhat starstruck by the fact that we had some fantastic board members. Yeah. And a lot of them were... You what know, would you do differently I, with that? I would definitely manage them a lot harder. Um, yeah. So I would give them a lot clearer bound. I would, I would make sure that I'm the person leading the of the calls and the direction and that I would have a very clear outline as to how we're allocating time. Mm -hmm. I would hold them accountable for, for having to perform for the business and do things to earn their, to earn their equity. And I think everybody on our board definitely earned their equity, but I think we could have leaned on them harder and like made it a lot more clear that, you know, we needed certain things done in certain time periods. And that was, and if it's not happening, it's completely unacceptable. And, you know, yeah. rather than just like kind of being like starstruck by them but, and then just being like, well, what do we do? You know, go to them and say, here's what I'm thinking about. Mm. How, you know, like, what, what are we missing? Kind of test your thinking uh, to them. Yeah. Like, I mean, see, like, uh, they, yeah. like, like them, they, they need to be brought in. They, they need to be brought in to solve the tough problems. That's why they're there. They yeah. can't help. They're not, you shouldn't be wasting their time on the, on the smaller issues. So. I'd be making better use of their time. I'd be managing them better and I'd be holding them accountable more. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny, you know, Jeremy, each one of these things, it could be like a full-time job, right? Hiring 100%. people. I mean, alone. Um, attracting good talent. How did you, what do you think worked best with attracting good talent? Like you said. Because it's yeah. one thing like wanting someone who's very experienced is another thing, getting that person on board with your mission, attracting them and getting them to... So you can hire them. Yeah. So attracting good talent. One, you got to be talented yourself. Yeah. Good people don't work for crappy organizations. So you have to build an organization where people, I think, are drinking the Kool Aid or have something really to offer because good people want to go where other good people are. Yeah. Uh, two, you got to be super transparent and like you actually got to give a crap about the other person. Yeah. And I think we were always very transparent about how things are. Um, you know, we were very direct with people about you know the things that we really liked about them. Uh, part of it, in terms of identifying good people, is kind of the hunches that you get. Um, like, I guess I've been lucky enough to spend really a lot of time in my life around really, really great people. And so, you know, 
you see certain patterns amongst people yeah. that happen when they're when they're A players. And yeah, B what are some patterns that you look at and you see? Yeah, I, I like to find people that are curious. Um, so like people that are like like you for example, like you're obviously into entrepreneurship. Like you run your own your own practice, but you're doing things related to startups on the side, and you're you're geeking out over the fact that you're going to talk to all these awesome entrepreneurs. I would just say that's awesome. You genuinely love being. Uh, you definitely love being a business person. And like for me, in my personal time, like I'm always reading books on self-improvement yeah. or managing or, um, or organizational design, all these other things. And I just find that like the people that want to get better yeah. and are constantly tweaking and searching and pushing the limits are going to get better than yeah. some, it's got the God-given talent. Uh, yeah. You can work at it all day long and you'll get there. That's one of the things I look for. Um, I look for, How do you measure that in an interview? What, are there certain things you you just see, or do you actually go? You ask this question because it's going to invoke some kind of curious response. I think I think you kind of get to it as you just uncover, you just talk to them, just about them. Yeah, you'll get them to you know ask them a lot of open ended questions to see where they have to say. Yeah, um, you know, like a lot of them talk about learning and developing skills. Mm. And growing versus you know doing things for pay. Um, yeah. When you're doing things for just pay, you're done. You're toast. Yeah. Uh, I would say, you know, like histories, like you know, good histories of success. Like you know, if you're a successful person, you find a way to become successful in a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. And I think that those things show up too. And part of it is also the feel and the vibe that you get. Like you know, I've um, that's definitely one of the things that I've learned is that you could have really talented people though. If they're not the right vibe in the organization, then it's not right. Mm -hmm. you, you need to have people that you want to work alongside. Yeah. At the yeah. end of the yeah. day, you're going to go through a lot of crap yeah. with them. It's just got to yeah. be good. Maintaining a culture in the company. How you know when you grow so fast like you guys did? How do you maintain that culture? Yeah, so I'm. You know, that it definitely becomes harder. I mean, you need to find people in the organization that want to become the the centers for culture themselves and, and inspire them. You know, so this is like you know helping. You know, like, you know, like for me, it was like, you know, really empowering, you know, our office manager to, you know, put together fun team events and, you know, help you know, having them be the eyes and the ears of, you know, how people are feeling in the organization. S still spending more time, I think, for us, you know, culture is important. Like you're still doing one on ones with people where you're just like sitting down and you're, you're talking directly with them. I think that created a culture of trust. Part of it is the things that you do as a founder, too. Like if you're trying to preach one thing in your organization and you do something differently, that sends a really big signal. If you're going to say that this is what you stand for from a culture perspective, you got to do it. Mm -hmm. So you know, for for us, like you know, we had this unlimited time off policy, um, but we would make use of it. We'd go on our trips. But if there was something I would change, I think actually, like, I think I actually would implement uh, a strict take your time off policy. And mm, you'd make people do it. I would almost like make people do it. Right. Well. I wouldn't make them do it, but I I would want to say, you look, you penalize them. I no, I wouldn't penalize them. I oh. would say you got your three weeks, and then just remind them that hey, you still have it, and you know I would, don't want to see you lose it. Like it's totally something like you should make use of. Yeah, because I I feel like a lot of people kind of get scared sometimes of taking their time off. Yeah. Why do you, why would you why do you think that's so important? I, oh I mean, God. I'm not disagreeing or agreeing. I just think it's interesting because yeah. part of the startup culture is like you said, like you're working 18 hours a day and and nonstop just trying to get get the there's business a, up. There's a few things. The first thing yeah. is that, like one, just as being like a human being, it's like a good thing, you know what I mean? Like I don't want to know that somebody's just working the rest of their life. Like I hope that they go through and have other things that interest them. They can spend time with the people that they love and they can experience some new things because I like doing that, right. you know? Yeah. And I would say another thing is um, – from just a an objectivity perspective, like you can get way too bogged down in the weeds, and like you forget of like how unproductive you're being if you don't have mm. that high macro view of things. I see. But when you come back, you come back refreshed. Life, you come back refreshed and clear headed, and you can just be like, "No, this is a waste of time," because like the ideal the ideal person is somebody that knows how to work harder than everybody else, but also knows how to work smarter. And yeah. this is like attacking the work smarter piece. Yeah. And, and just a heads up, um, I probably need to be wrapping this up soon, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. How, what do we have? How many minutes? So I look. Uh, let's maybe like five or ten more. Okay. okay. Is that cool with you? Yeah. I mean, I can go for three more hours, but no, we'll take awesome. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so talk about some of the milestones, you know, along the way 
that obviously the first parking garage was a huge milestone. Just take us through some of the big milestones of, of Spot Hero that you consider big milestones. Yeah. Um, so there's the, I'm just going to go in, in linear order. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first one was getting the idea for the business. Yeah. Next one was just taking a step forward, getting a logo, at least moving it forward. Right. Um, after that, it was getting a business partner. I thought that was really important um, because like, I, you could just achieve more by having a second person there. Um, at least for me, that's how it worked. Uh, we had our first version of our website up and it was just a, a real, real version of like an MVP. Uh, we started, I'd say once we were actually like profitable was, was, was a milestone. That's a huge milestone. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was really, how early. long was it until you were profitable? I mean, it was probably like after we had started working on it, maybe a year and a half, maybe only like six months after we had a real like website launched. Uh, Maybe it shouldn't be profitable. It's like ramen profitability where we could actually pay ourselves a little bit. Right. So it's probably close to like two years in. Uh, t getting into tech stars and doing the program was definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, getting the CTO was a huge one. Uh, and that was later the third business partner that happened before that. Raising the capital, two and a half was huge. Mm -hmm. um, getting to the point where we expanded to another city was big. Then the subsequent rounds of financing, and then I'd say key team additions along the way. Yeah. Those are all some like the big milestones that I look at for the yeah. business. Yeah, I mean, we could have just talked the whole interview just about raising money. And oh my, oh my gosh, See, like uh, you could talk for days all about that. So give a couple tips, like you know, maybe things people should wa watch out for um, when they're raising money or to think about that's important that you found is important after the fact. Well, it depends on the stage of the business. Yeah. If you're really, really early on and you're trying to get investment before doing anything, I just think that's a total waste of time. Like either you're somebody that knows people with the cash. Yeah. Um, or you've got like an impressive enough background where yeah. somebody's willing to just like throw you some money. You're saying I, prove it out first. I'm, I'm much a yeah. bigger fan of just get out there and start doing. Okay. Yeah. Just do it. You know, like we wasted a lot of time talking to investors who kind of yanked us around early on because they could because we didn't have any traction and it was kind of fun now looking back at it where they're like my biggest regret was not investing in you which was which is cool what you like I, to hear yeah. some, some some vindication but i mean that's just all that's all just like stuff to make your ego feel better right and i mean that's probably not the right approach in life anyways um so that's one uh Investing is about relationships. Just going into cold into somebody's office is, I think, kind of difficult. Like you develop relationships over time, and sometimes maybe it's only yeah. a few meetings. But like at the end of the day, we're people and we're relationships. Like everything that happens yeah. in this world is people and relationships. Yeah, and some good software yeah. along the way. And Talk about that for a second. The technology. What yeah. for you are the milestones of the technology? Because you have to keep innovating the technology. Totally. Uh, there are three things that really come to mind. One was getting the first version of the website up. Second was the mobile app, and that was awesome because you know I, mobile is really where the direction of the yeah. future is. It's, it's you're parking, you're on the go, you have your cell phone with you, you don't have your freaking computer with you. Yeah. The other one I'd say was some of the hardware integrations that were pulled off. Um, so we were able to sync up with the actual hardware devices that are that let you into a garage. So that way, it's crazy. It, like a QR bought, code, like you scan it, like that type yeah, of thing. Yes. Yeah, so now somebody can yeah. buy it on their mobile app. They can get to the garage, scan in, and then a gate pops open. It's like a real VIP experience. Yeah. I think those like three things really stick out of my eye. I always think like, is this going to work? Like when I go up to the thing using Spot Hero, is this actually going to work on my phone? You know, because you're like, this is too, it seems too complicated. What are some things like if people are really want to form a technology based company, what are some of the, the challenges people should look out for? Yeah. Um, so for us at first, uh, one, you need to find technicians and you got to understand like if, if you're try like, if you think it's hard to try, try like try and go out f dating like the hot girl, like it's much harder to get a, to to date the the good engineer, because everybody in the world wants the good engineer, and the right. good engineer is going to make somewhere between one hundred twenty five and two hundred thousand dollars, and you probably don't have any money, um, or you've got minimal amounts of money. So you got to understand like you're up in a marketplace where Google, Amazon, everybody in the world can easily throw these people a whole lot more than you can with better benefits. Yeah. And you probably don't know exactly what you're doing and why are these guys going to come join you. So getting the technology staff is going to be very difficult. Um, what else about technology? You need to find people who know what they're doing. Um, you know, We had an early developer who we didn't quite understand exactly why he was spending his time with us, but he wanted to – he basically – he wanted to build up our website – 
and we had two different approaches we could take. We had one which is like, imagine you're, you're a home builder and you've got a blueprint for the suburban house that you've made 10,000 times where it's like it's just the exact same house just repeated. It has certain restrictions that only allow you three bedrooms yeah. and two bathrooms, but it always looks the same, but for the most part it is a house and as long as you're as long as you're building it within the confines of the blueprint, you're all good or you can go through and, and build the mansion, okay? Yeah. And the mansion's going to go through and take 10 times longer. It may be a little bit nicer and prettier, but you know, what we found out was that the mansion approach was the wrong approach. We mm. lost a lot of time because of it. Mm. And we weren't smart enough at the time to understand that we shouldn't have gone that route. Yeah. So, you know, when in, if somebody's building a, a mobile a tech startup, they should really, and it's, if it's going to be web based, they should consider using a framework first until it breaks. Like technology, it's like build something till it breaks. Right. And then, you know, by that point, by the next milestone, I think you'll have enough resources to build something better. Around, although the technicians may disagree with me on this, and you know, I, I just don't think I'm that industry expert yet to give the best feedback on that. Yeah. yeah. So I know we have I have 70 more questions. I'm going to limit it to two. Cool, Jeremy. Um, you know, the obvious question, which you probably get all the time, is what made you decide to take time off and, and step away? Yeah. And then um, your current role. Yeah, definitely. There were a number of things, but kind of on the highest level. Um, the business was really growing and like, you know, people had to specialize more and I found myself having to kind of, you know, specialize into some smaller areas when my true passion is more in getting my hands in a bunch of different cookie jars. Mm. So that was really one of them. And, you know, I think also at the same time, like I looked at the business, like we really needed different skill sets, you know, like I'm definitely a great person to try to figure out how to get something done um, and experiment. Uh, but we, th I think we really needed more managers. And so I looked kind of at that future mm. and I'm like, look. I think we that's could a tough some... thing. This is real tough. It's your, yeah, like your, it's... your baby. Yeah, it is. But you know, it's not just my baby. There's a lot of other people involved yeah. who made it happen. And so, you know, I didn't necessarily, I think I was lucky that I didn't necessarily feel like it was only my baby Yeah. because, you know, I think that could have potentially biased my decision making. But, you know, a number of these things came to the table and, you know, I, I you know, I had to make a very tough decision of, you know, that it was time to move on. And I think the business is now in a better place because I think a lot of other people have gotten a chance to really step up yeah. and assume leadership positions or fill positions where there might have been a gap previously that um, where somebody could actually do something better than what I could do. Yeah. And your role, what's your role now with Spider? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm still uh, obviously an equity holder in the business, a fairly large one at that. Um, but, you know, I stay in touch with everybody there. And it's basically if there's something, an area that I can help on, I'm always there to go mm -hmm. through and help them. But, they're doing a really good job and are running everything pretty yeah. pretty autonomously. So last thing, Jeremy, thank you so much for your time, by the way. I yeah, appreciate it. it. Um, your proudest moment through, my, through the journey of Spot Hero. My proudest moment. Um, there are probably like two things. There's probably one for the company and one for maybe there might be like there might be three. Um, when the, fir the first time we, when we raised our first two and a half million dollars, I mean, we just had a really insane sprint of going through the Techstars program and then had this crazy run through Silicon Valley where we, we kind of got stomped on in our first VC meeting. And just, <laughs> well, Screw it. We're going to like go out there, balls out to the wall, you know, going forward. And, you know, we were able to get a two and a half million bucks in the door on pretty good terms with a really great investor. And I think that was something that was really awesome is like, hey, we're legit. There was a period, too, where we moved into our most recent office where it really started feeling like, wow, we're, we're a, like a legit company. Yeah. And I think one of the third things, one of the, one of the things that was really per personally meant a lot to me yeah. was that um, uh, I had had a few employees underneath me quit early on mm. because I just wasn't necessarily the right manager. Um, and... You know, I think I didn't know how to handle situations with them. So, you know, one of the other people who had joined that that I was working with probably for about six months before I left, um, I was able to develop a really great relationship with. And, you know, I would finally figured out how to, I think, manage a lot better by that point. And I got a really nice card from her after I had left the business a few mm -hmm. months afterwards. Wow. Just on, uh, on, it was on boss's day or whatever. And she said, even though I wasn't her boss anymore, it's just like, thank you for being the best boss I ever mm. had. Wow. Still somebody, still somebody young. And there are going to be, she'll have plenty of other bosses much better than me. But it was, 
definitely something that made me feel really good because I was able to make enough of an impact on her for the positive where, yeah. you know, she thought of even letting me know something like that even like way after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. And that made me feel, that made me feel really good. Yeah. Jeremy, huge thanks. This has been amazing. I can go on and on awesome. for, for hours. Where can people reach out, say thank you, say hello? Yeah, totally. Um, find people, you. People can uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, they can email me, jeremy at spothero.com. Right. Um, if you're in San Francisco and you're cool, um, let's, get, let's get together. <laughs> let's do something active. I don't really like sitting around. So I'm, I'm always down to do that and you know, always looking to grow, grow a network out there because I don't know too many people. Cool. Really appreciate it, Jeremy. Thanks so much. Definitely. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.